Today, I'm going to talk about capacitor time constants. So naturally, I'm going to talk about compressed air. So let's look at the way compressed air works. Let's start out with an air compressor. That would be a motorized, sort of like an engine running backwards. We have a piston and a cylinder that's attached to a crankshaft, that's attached to a motor, and that makes the piston go up and down in the cylinder. And we have some one-way check valves to make sure that it sucks air in one side, blows it out the other. And so we have air going in and air coming out. And that we're going to send to a compressed air tank. Let's put a little gauge on top of there that we'll use a little later to measure the pressure inside the tank. So let's say that this pump will produce 100 pounds per square inch. Now what we're going to do is we're going to put a little air into that tank. And what's going to happen? You put a little air in, you get a little bit of pressure. So the pressure gauge goes up just a bit. Now we put some more air in, what happens? More air means more pressure. So it goes up a bit more. We put more air in, we get more pressure. And we can keep doing that, put more air in, more pressure, more air in, and more pressure, and we can keep doing that until one of two things happens. Either we have put so much air in here that the pressure is now 100 pounds per square inch over here. So now the pressure in the tank is pushing back at the pump as hard as the pump is pushing at the tank, and so it won't fill any more. So the maximum pressure we can get in the tank is the maximum pressure that we get from the pump. So we have pumped air into the tank until we just can't pump any more. The other thing that could happen is let's say that this tank was able to handle, let's say rated at 100 PSI, and let's say this can go to 200 PSI. Well, if we exceed this by a certain amount, then they'll put some safety margin in there, but somewhere along the line, that tank is going to explode. So we can put air into that tank until one of two things happens. Either we can't push any more simply because it has the same pressure as our pump, or the tank fails and explodes. And let's take another look at the way this works. Let's go back to our 100 PSI and go back to zero. And just want to make a point here. Remember that when this is, and this is the maximum pressure here, I'll just leave that there. Oh, get that out of the way, it might be confusing. Okay, so, so there we have the tank, and it has zero pounds per square inch. What does that mean? Well, remember, when you're measuring pressure of any kind, you're always comparing one pressure to another. So when this has zero PSI, remember that gauge is measuring the pressure outside the tank and comparing it to the pressure inside the tank. And so at sea level, the air pressure is approximately 15 pounds per square inch. So that's pushing in on the tank. And what this is saying when it says there's zero PSI in the tank, it says that inside the tank we also have 15 pounds per square inch pushing out. So the gauge says zero when the pressure inside and the pressure outside are equal. So remember, a pressure gauge measures two pressures and tells you the difference. And so, once again, when it's zero PSI, simply the inside pressure is the same as the outside pressure, which is 15 PSI at sea level. Now let's go ahead and start pumping air in. And it's not going to happen instantly. We put some air in, we're going to get some pressure back. So let's say we push in a little bit of air and we get, oh, let's say 20 PSI. And we keep pumping. Now this is pushing back a little bit. So it's not going to be able to pump as much air. So let's say it took, oh, let's say one minute to get to 20 PSI. If we keep pumping, how long is it going to take to get to 40 PSI? It's going to take more than one minute. Let's just for explanation purposes say it took two minutes to get to 40 PSI, so now we've gone a total of three minutes. How long is it going to take to get to 60 PSI? Well, let's assume that now it's going to take three minutes. And so every time we go up another 20 PSI, it takes us another minute. So now it's been six minutes. So notice that as it fills, it gets slower and slower. And let's say 
we put a restriction in the pipe here, that's going to slow it down even more. So the speed that this tank fills is going to be dependent on how much pressure we can produce and how much of a restriction this hose is to uh, fill it. And also it's going to relate to how big the tank is. Of course, if we double the size of the tank, it's going to take twice as long to get to each one of these milestones. So the speed that this tank fills depends on how much pressure we can give it, how much resistance to the airflow the hose has, and how big the tank is. So as we fill it up, it takes longer and longer because the tank is pushing back more and more. And so it takes um, a certain amount of time, let's say we get to, uh, to get to finally to 100 PSI, it might take, what, maybe 20 minutes or so, where it took only one minute to get to the first 20 pounds. It took another 18 minutes to get to the other 80 PSI. So it takes longer and longer to fill as it fills up. You've probably experienced this when filling tires. If they're very low, you put the air chuck on there and it starts to fill up very fast, but as it gets close to the pressure you want, it slows down a bit, especially if the pump is close to the pressure that you want for the tire. So if you have 100 pounds per square inch going into the tire, it's going to fill pretty quickly. But if you only produce maybe 50 pounds per square inch, you'll notice it slows down considerably as you get close to the 30 pounds that is normal for a tire. So that's what happens when we fill a compressed air tank. Now let's look what happens with electricity and a capacitor. So now we're going to start out with a battery and a capacitor. And let's put a switch up here just for good measure. So I can turn on and turn off the flow. And I'm simplifying things a little bit here. We'll complicate them a little more down the road. But right now, I close the switch for a certain amount of time. And what's going to happen? Current is going to flow. Conventional current is going to flow this way. And remember from our lesson on capacitors that when we first start to flow current into a capacitor, it looks like a short circuit. And so what happens is we get positive charges piling up on this plate of the capacitor. Remember, a capacitor is simply two conductors separated by an insulator, and the conductors are usually plate-shaped to give you lots of surface area. So these positive charges build up on this side, and they drive positive charges off the other side, causing the net charge to be higher pressure here, lower pressure here, so we end up with a charge on there, so we get a positive to negative charge on the battery. Let's see what happens to the voltage as we do that. Let's say this is a 100 volt battery, and we won't worry about resistance right now, we'll worry about that later, but let's just say things are such that uh, we put a little bit of electricity in, and we get maybe, oh, 10 volts. What's going to happen if we put more in? We're going to get more voltage. Let's say put a little more in, we get 20 volts. This is going to act very similar to the air tank. I put a little electricity in, I get a little voltage. I put more electricity in, I get more voltage. And I put more electricity in, I get more voltage. And eventually, this is going to get up to our 100 volts. So what's happening now? This is looking pretty much like a battery. Remember, it doesn't really work like a battery. It's just electricity stored under... Uh, pressure, if you will, very similar to the air tank where we are storing air under pressure. Putting electricity into a capacitor is like putting electricity under pressure. So as it goes up, it gets more and more, more and more voltage over here, and eventually it gets up to the same voltage. So now the battery is pushing this way as hard as the capacitor is pushing that way, and we get no more flow, so it stops flowing. So we can push electricity into the capacitor, put a little in, we get some voltage, a little more in, we get more voltage, and we can keep doing that until either the voltage of the capacitor now equals our battery voltage, and now it's pushing back as hard, and so we can't push any more in, or let's say this capacitor is rated at 100 volts. And capacitors do have a voltage rating. You look at them, they will all have a voltage rating on them. And that has a 100 volt rating. And let's say this is 200 volts. Now we can get to a higher voltage. And some voltage higher than 100 volts, the insulation of this capacitor is going to break down and fail. And as a matter of fact, certain types of capacitors, particularly electrolytic capacitors, can actually explode when they fail. 
So just like the air tank, we put a little air in, we get a little pressure, a little more in, we get more pressure, and we can keep doing that until one of two things happens. Either we just can't push in anymore, or the tank explodes. With the capacitor, we can put a little electricity in, we get a little voltage. We put more electricity in, we get more voltage. And we can keep doing that until one of two things happens. Either we just can't push in anymore, or the insulation fails, and the capacitor might even explode. So there we see, in this particular context, this capacitor acts almost exactly like an air storage tank to store electricity. So like an air storage tank stores air under pressure, a capacitor appears to store electricity under electrical pressure or voltage. And that's what the capacitor does. Now also, just like I said, if our hose in the compressed air system uh, was more restrictive, then it would take longer to fill up that tank with air. Same thing happens with the capacitor. If we put some resistance in here, it's going to take longer to fill this capacitor with electricity than without the resistance. And also, just like the air tank, if we make that a bigger capacitor, it will take longer to fill it up. If we double the amount of capacitance, we're going to double the time it takes to get to each milestone as we start to uh, charge it up. So now let's look at some more practical aspects of how this works. Let's go ahead and modify the circuit a little bit. I'm going to draw it just a little bit bigger just to help out here. So here's our battery. And we're going to put a switch here. We're going to put a couple of switches in here and make a circuit that we can use for a particular thought experiment. Let's put a resistor here. Here is our capacitor and back to the battery. And I'm going to put another switch here just to help the thought experiment out. And let's make this a one volt battery. And let's make this a one farad capacitor. And while we're at it, what do you think? How about a one ohm resistor? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to close the switch because just like you know that air tank we filled up, what if there's already some air in it? Well, then things would have been a little different. So to do the experiment correctly, we needed to open up the valve and let all the air out of that tank to make sure that the pressure inside was the same as the pressure outside before we started. So let's do the same thing here. I'm going to close this switch and that's going to make a circuit here. So if the battery had any charge on it, it will now cause the current to flow in this direction and it will discharge and it will equalize the charge on each plate so that now we put a voltmeter across here and we wait until the voltmeter sees that the voltage is the same on both sides. Remember, a voltmeter is a type of pressure gauge, and so it is telling us the difference between two voltages. So if this voltmeter reads zero volts, I'm going to move this over a little bit so we can see things better. So if that reads zero volts, that simply means that the voltage on this side of the capacitor is the same as the voltage on that side of the capacitor. So flipping this switch causes the capacitor to cause current to flow in this direction until the voltages equalize, and now the voltmeter will read zero volts. So now we're at a good starting point for this thought experiment. So let's go ahead and open that switch up so that the capacitor will hold whatever charge we put in. Now we're going to close this switch. And how long are we going to close it? We're going to close it for exactly one second. And then we're going to open it. Now what's happened during that one second is we now had a connection through here, so we had current flowing this way. So electricity is going to go into the capacitor and the voltage is going to increase. What's the voltage going to increase to? I bet you're going to think, ah, I'll bet one volt. Not quite. In fact, those of you who know a little about what I'm talking about probably know exactly where it's going to go. So let's look at the numbers. I have one farad, one ohm, one volt, and one second. So I close the switch for one second. The voltage increases to what? 0 0.632 volts. So one farad, one ohm, one second, one volt, that capacitor will charge up to 0 0.632 volts.
And let's do that again just to get a number that we can stick in our minds a little bit. I'm just going to increase this to 100 ohm. I'm just going to increase this to 100 volts. And let's do it again because I like the number we come up with. Let's just charge the capacitor till we're back to zero volts. Now we're going to close that for one second. And now what's the voltage going to be? Well, we increased this by a factor of 100. So this is going to go up by a factor of 100. So when we had one volt here, we got 0.632 volts here. Now we're going to get 63.2 volts. So let's look at that for just a second. So starting at zero, we have 100 volt source. Here's the key numbers, one farad, one ohm. We close this for one second, then open it, and we end up with 63.2 volts across it. I use that because that is 63.2% of the source voltage. So if we go back to our one volt, and we got 0.632 volts. Once again, that is 63.2% of the battery voltage. Why is that? It's just the way it is. Because of the way we measure resistance and capacitance and time, it just turns out that we get this 63.2% of the source voltage. Once again, we close this for one second, the voltage increases, and when we open it after exactly one second, we will have exactly 63.2% of the battery voltage. This is called the resistance capacitance time constant. So it's a universal constant. It's always going to be the same. Just like we have gravitational constants and other constants in uh, physics, this is a constant in electronics. It will always be there, 63.2%. So if we have one ohm and one farad, and close the switch for one second, we end up with 63.2% of the source voltage. That's where that 63.2% comes from. Now, as we've already seen, this is going to happen in the first second, but what's going to happen when we close this for another second? Well, it's going to not charge as quickly because now this is pushing back a little bit, so it's going to hit the next milestone, whatever that is, uh, it's going to take a little longer or, well, let's go ahead and take a look at what happens. We're going to look at even time intervals rather than how long it takes to get to a particular milestone. So I'm going to erase this so I can draw a graph. So remember what this is. We're simply charging the capacitor for a certain amount of time and we have a certain amount of resistance and capacitance. We're going to stay at one ohm and one farad, except I'm going to go back to 100 volts so we get these numbers. So let's draw a graph here. And let's put time marks down here. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's 1 second, 2 seconds, 3 seconds, 4 seconds, and 5 seconds. And over here we'll put our voltage. So we're going to have 100 volts on the battery. And let's see, that's going to be about 50 volts. This will be about 75. We're going to be rather rough here. 25 and zero volts. Okay, so what's going to happen? We're going to close that switch for one second. The capacitor is going to charge and end up after one second, we're going to end up at 63.2 volts, roughly right about, I'm looking at this at an angle, so I hope I don't get it too crooked, right about there. So one second, we get up to 63.2 volts. Now what's going to happen in the next second? Well, we have 63.2, and here's 100 volts up here. So what's left over? We have 36.8 volts left to go. So what's going to happen when I close that switch for another second? So we have to go from 63.2 to 100 volts. That's how far we have to go. How long is it going to take to get to the next? Well, what's, let's see what's going to happen if we charge for one more second. Well. This is 63.2% of the top voltage. So what's going to happen? We're going to go 63.2% further. So we have 100 volts, 63.2 volts, which is a total of 36.8 volts. So we're going to go up 
63.2% of 36.8 volts. So we're just going to go 63.2% of the difference left over. So let's figure out what that is. I should have this memorized, but I don't. So what do we have? We have 36.8 times 0.632 equals 23.2 volts. So 23.2 plus 63.2 gives us 86.4 volts. Let's call it 86.5. So the next milestone, let's erase these distractions here. The next milestone is going to go up to 86.5, let's see, 7500 right about, what do you think, right about there? Don't need to be perfect here. So that's going to be 86.5 volts, or 86.5%. So in the first second, we go up 63.2%. The next second, we go up to 86.5%. What is that? We have gone 63.2% of the remaining difference. So we went 63.2%, 63.2% of what's left. So what's going to happen after another second? All right, so we're at 86.5. What do we have left over? So there's our 100. So 100 minus 86.5 gives us 13.5 volts left. So we have to go another 63.2% of 13.5. So what's that? Times 0.632 equals, that's going to be 8.5 volts. So we take 86.5 and add 8.5. And we get 95.0. So our next milestone here, let's see, right about, what do you think, right about, there, 95 volts. So we're getting pretty close to the 100. So after three seconds, once again, 100 volts, and our resistance is one ohm and one farad for our capacitor. And so after three seconds, we're up to 95 volts. Okay, so what's the next milestone? Well, we have 95 to 100, that's a 5 volt difference, so what's 63.2% of 5? 5? 5 times 0.632 equals 3.16 volts more. So 95 plus 3.16, and that's going to be 98.1, so we'll just call it 98, let's call it 98.1, just to because we are going to one decimal point there. So 98.1 volts. So what do you think? Pretty, pretty close to the top there. Draw this right there. 98.1 volts. And let's go one more time. We're still about two volts away from 100 volts. So let's call that 98.1. We have to go, well, what's the difference between that and 100? So 100 minus 98.1 equals, we've got 1.9 volts left to go. What's 63.2% of that times 0.632 equals, that's going to be 1.2 volts. So 98.1 plus 1.2 equals 99.3 volts. So when we get to five seconds, we've gotten up to 99.3 volts. So that is the way the capacitor charges. Let's just even these out a little bit just because I want them to look even because they really will be. That looks kind of even. So what happens is when we start charging for the first second, it charges pretty quick, going up to 63.2 volts. But now it's pushing back so it's not gonna charge as fast. So the next milestone after another second, we're only up to 86.5 volts, which we've gone 63.2% of the remaining voltage. Now, in another second, we go another 63.2% of the remaining voltage, 95 volts. The next second, we go another 63.2% of the remaining voltage. Now we're at 98.1. And at five seconds, we've gone up to, I'm going to try to make that as flat as I can, because for all intents and purposes, just make that a little higher. There we go. Just so I can flatten that out a little more. There we go. We're up at 99.3. So for all intents and purposes, after five seconds, 
we're pretty close to that 100 volt. So what's going to happen after another second? It's going to go another 63.2% of what's left over. So we're going to get to 99.4, 99.4 something, 99.2. So it's going to be pretty flat after this. Get closer and closer and closer. Never, never actually reaches 100 volts, but we get pretty close. So we consider that after five seconds, that capacitor is going to be completely charged. That's if we have one ohm and one farad. So I don't want to redraw the circuit. I want to keep the graph here. So let's see what happens if we change these components. Let's change the resistance to two ohms. Now what's going to happen? Well, what we're going to find out is that now this takes, I want to leave these numbers here, so I'm going to write new numbers in red. So now with 2 ohms, let's put a red 2 here to remind us that now we've changed to 2 ohms. Now it's going to take 2 seconds to get to 63.2 volts. It's now going to take 4 seconds to get to 86.5, 6, 8, and 10. So notice that I doubled the resistance. I doubled the time it takes to get to each one of these milestones. Let's see what happens if I put the resistance back at zero, excuse me, at one, and put the capacitor at two farads. Now what's going to happen? What we're going to find is that it's going to now take, again, two seconds to get to our first milestone, 63.2, four seconds to the next one, four to the next, or six, then eight, and then 10. So if I double either one of those, I double the time it takes to get to each milestone. Now, let's see what happens if I double them both. Let's put that in blue because we can. Two ohms and two farads. Now let's see what happens. Now it takes four seconds to get to the first milestone, eight seconds to get to the next one, 12 to get to the next one, 16, and it's not 32, I'm going in powers of 2 there, 16, 20, there we go. Started thinking in powers of 2 for a second. Uh, so now it takes four times as long to get to each milestone. So if we look at that, we can find out that, oh, there's a formula here that tells us how long it will take to get to each milestone. So Let's erase that and write that up there. Turns out that if we take our resistance times our capacitance, so resistance times capacitance equals the time it takes our 63.2% of the source. So R times C, resistance times capacitance, tells us the time in seconds that it will take to reach 63.2% of the source voltage. So what's the source voltage? Well, we'll look at some different voltages a little later, but let's just look at the official formula here. That time, which is called the resistance capacitance time constant, or an RC time constant, is represented by the Greek letter tau and equals resistance times capacitance. That is, again, the time it takes to reach our 63.2 volts. So what if this is a different voltage? Well, we'll look at that a little later, but we can have a different voltage here, and we always reach 63.2% of that. So if we now look at our seconds here from our first experiment when this was one ohm and one farad, we find that that is now actually our time constants. So we'll just put a little Greek letter tau down here. That's a rather terrible looking tau, isn't it? A little tilde, a little hook. There, it's a Greek letter tau. And this is percent voltage. So this is no longer 100 volts. It is now 100%. And these are no longer volts, they are percentages. 
And no matter what our combination of resistance and capacitance or voltage is, we can use this formula to predict what percentage of our top voltage we are going to reach after each time constant. Now remember with the 1 ohm and 1 farad, these were seconds. But when we had 2 ohms and 1 farad, each of these became 2 seconds. So 1 time constant was 2 seconds. 2 time constants was 4 seconds. 3 time constants was 6 seconds. 4 time constants was 8 seconds. And 5 time constants was 10 seconds. And if we also doubled the capacitance, then each of these became 4 seconds. 4, 8, 12, 16, and 20 seconds. So these are time constants, no longer seconds, and the time constant will be a certain number of seconds. Let's see what happens if we change, I'm going to leave that up there, let's see if we change our values to something more practical. Let's say we have 100 ohms and 100 microfarads. What's this going to do to us? I'm going to move this up here just to get it out of the way. These are time constants, Greek letter tau. So now we have, remember the circuit, we just had a battery, a resistor, and a capacitor in series. So we have now 100 ohms and 100 microfarads. So what's that tell us? R times C. Well, 100 ohms times 100 microfarads, that's going to be 100 times 0 0.0001. So a microfarad is 0 0.000001. That's one microfarad. This would be 10 microfarads. And there's 100 microfarads. So 100 microfarads is 0 0.0001 farads. So that's how I do the calculation. So here we go. 100 times 0 0.0001 equals, gives us a time constant of 0 0.01 seconds, or 10 milliseconds. 40 milliseconds and 50 milliseconds. So now we will reach these points at these times. So now we have a capacitor that's charging pretty fast, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 milliseconds. Uh, we're not even up to a tenth of a second, and it's already fully charged. Just to make sure we understand this, let's use uh, something different. How about, 100 mic how about 100 ohms and, let's say, 33 microfarads? Another possibly realistic time constant. So what do we do is we multiply those together. 100 times, let's see, 33 microfarads, that's going to be 0 .000033. Let's write that up here just to make sure you understand. So. 0 0.00003, well, that would be 3 microfarads, and we multiply that by 10 to make it 33. So that's going to be 33 microfarads is 0 0.000033 farads. So let's do the math. 100 times 0 0.000033 equals, and we have 3.3 times 10 to the minus third. or 3.3 milliseconds. So now this is 3.3 milliseconds. This is going to be 6.6 .6 milliseconds. This will be 9.9 .9 milliseconds. And 9.9 .9 .9 plus 3.3, .3, that's going to be 9.9 .9 plus 3.3 .3 equals 13.2 milliseconds, and 13.2 plus 3.3 .3 equals 16.5. So notice we still have our time constants here, one time constant, two time constants, on to five time constants, but now the times are 3.3 .3 milliseconds, 6.6, 9.9, .9, 13.2, and 16.5. So now this reaches our essentially full charge after only 16.5 milliseconds. So that's how we can calculate our points of charge using the RC time constant and knowing how that works. Now let's do a little bit of editing magic. I just want to show a different circuit up here. Before we go back to this graph, I don't want to erase it. So there's our different circuit. So now we have the same circuit. What I'm going to do is open 
the charging switch and now I'm going to close the discharging switch. We are at the point now where the capacitor is fully charged. Let's go back to the one ohm and the one farad and it's fully charged to our 100 volts. Now I'm going to start discharging. Let's see what happens to this when we are discharging. So there's the circuit. Let's go back to our board here and what I'm going to do is erase all of these just to reduce the clutter. So now we're going to close that switch, the discharge switch, and that capacitor is going to start discharging. So what's going to happen? Current's going to flow. It's going to flow back in this direction away from the capacitor through here and the capacitor is going to start discharging. So what's going to happen is this voltage will start going down. And after one time constant, what do you think it's going to do? Well, 63.2%, it's not going up, it's going down. So we're going to start at 100%, in this case 100 volts, and we're going to lose 63.2%. So that leaves us with 36.8%. So we're going to be down here right, well, what about, uh, right about there. So now we've discharged down to 30. 6.8 volts or percent in the case of the one in the case of the 100 volts 1 ohm 1 farad we will be down to 36.8 volts so this has discharged and i'm going to just avoid writing over my black line so i don't contaminate my pen so now we're down to 36.8 volts so what's going to happen if we discharge it for another second well we're at 36.8 down to zero, we're going to lose another 63.2% of that 36.8. So let's find out what that is. 36.8 times 0.632 equals, and we have 23.5. So we're going to lose another 23.5 volts. So 36.8 minus 23.5, 36.8 minus 23.5 gives us a remaining of 13.3 volts. Right about, what do you think? Right about here. 13.3 volts with the circuit we showed, or 13.3% of our starting voltage. What's going to happen after another time constant? Okay, we're at 13.3 volts, so we're going to lose 63.2% of that. So 13.3 times 0.632 equals. We're going to lose another 8.4 volts. So 13.3 minus 8.4 leaves us with 4.9 volts. So just about, there are about 5 volts, that looks about right, 4.9. Now we're going to go another time constant, so it's 4.9 volts times 0.632 equals, that's going to be 3.1 volts, 3.09, 3.09 would be 3.1 volts going to lose another 3.1 volts, so 4.9, 4.9 minus 3.09 equals, we're going to be to 1.8 volts, right about 1.8. And then after 5 seconds, we're going to lose 63.2% of 1.8 times 0.632 equals, that's going to be 1.14 so 1.8 minus 1.14 equals 0.66 volts or 0.66 percent. And so now it's going to pretty much stay there. It'll never completely discharge, but it'll get closer and closer and closer. So after five time constants, in this case of one ohm and one farad, it's five seconds, we're going to be down to 0.66 volts and it's just get lower and lower as we keep discharging. So notice the discharge curve looks like the charge curve flipped. And if you want to calculate this, well, we start with our starting voltage and we lose, we lose 63.2 volts down to 36.8 volts. So there is capacitor time constants, which tells us how a capacitor charges and how it discharges. And so if we know our resistance and our capacitance, we can predict how far the capacitor is going to charge in each time constant. So the resistance times the capacitance tells us how long it takes if we're charging. R times C tells us how long it will take to reach 63.2% of the source voltage. And to calculate the other points, we just remember, 
we went 63.2% of our 100%, 63.2% of what was left over, 63.2% of what was left over after that, and after that, and after that. So we just keep going 63.2%, 63.2% of what is left, 63.2% of what is left. So if we ever need to calculate that all out, we can do that without any other knowledge. And the same thing with discharging. When we have a charged capacitor and we start to discharge, after one time constant, we're down to 36.8%. We lose 63.2%. We lose 63.2% of what is left. Another 63.2% of what is left and on down. And that's how a capacitor charges and discharges. And that's what we need to know. So R times C tells us the time in seconds it takes to move 63.2% closer to where we're going. So what use is this information? Well, anytime you need a circuit where you have something happen now and you want something else to happen sometime later, especially if that's a fairly short time, the quickest, easiest way to do that would be with a resistor and a capacitor and time that interval. So let's go ahead and draw a hypothetical circuit here. Let's say we want something to happen after six seconds. We flip a switch now, something happens six seconds later. Well, let's see, let's have our battery. There's our switch, a resistor, and a capacitor. And just for practical purposes, let's say this is a 100 microfarad capacitor. And we want this to get to 6.32 volts after, let's say, 10 seconds. So there's our switch. And let's say this is a 10 volt battery. So we can certainly get up to 6.32 volts. Now, the circuitry to do this might be a little complicated for this stage of the course using such things as operational amplifiers to make a trigger circuit. But we'll just say there's some circuit out here that at 6.32 volts, it's going to trigger it to go off. And we want that to take, um, let's say, 10 seconds to go. So how are we going to figure that out? We have 100 microfarads. We have 10 volts. We need to reach 6.32 volts. So we need to reach our 63.2%. So that's going to be our tau, 63.2%. And that equals our resistance times our capacitance, which we know is 100 microfarads. So all we need to do is figure out what resistor we'll put here to give us a time constant of exactly 10 seconds. So let's go ahead and uh, do a little bit of uh, algebra magic. Let's see if we want to put the we want to find R, so we're going to have to put the time up here. Our resistance equals our time divided by our capacitance. So our time is going to be 10 seconds. So with a little mathematic, I should be able to take our 10 and divide it by 0.0001. And that gives us a resistance of 100,000 ohms. Let's reverse the math and see if that works out. 100K times 100 microfarads, 100, 1, 2, 3, times 0 0.0001 equals, that gives us a time constant, that gives us 10 seconds. So it works out. So all we have to do is work the math out to figure out what resistance and capacitance combination it will take to get to take a certain amount of time for that capacitor to charge and it's just simply t equals rc and this is just like any other of our electronics formulas so just like ohm's law remember ohm's law e equals ir if we know our voltage we divide into it and so that means that i equals e over r and R equals E over I. So if we know your voltage, you divide into it. If you don't know your voltage, you multiply. Same thing works here. We can work that same formula the same way. Tau, or the time constant, equals RC. So if you, if you know your time constant, you divide into it. So we wanted 10 seconds, so we divide it into that. So just like that, we have, if we want our resistance, is going to equal our time constant, 0.0001 
divided by our capacitance, and our capacitance is going to equal our time constant divided by our resistance. So we can manipulate that formula just the same way we can manipulate Ohm's law. That's your simple basic algebraic formula, and that's how we've learned how to manipulate that. So if you ever need to time something in electronics, how do you do it? Simplest way, a resistor and a capacitor. Use that formula to calculate. If you know your capacitor, you use that to define the resistance. If you know your resistance, you use that to find the capacitor. And you can find what you need to get the time that you want to take to get to 63.2% of the voltage. Of course, if we want to make this last a little longer, we would just uh, work the, the idea appropriately. So let's say we want that was we wanted it to take 10 seconds to get here. Let's say we wanted it to take 20 seconds. We would just change tau appropriately. Let's look at a practical use for how capacitors charge and discharge that happens every day that you might find interesting. In a computer, we have a number of chips. I'll just show one chip. We'll say it's the CPU. But this would actually be tied into all of the digital chips in the circuit to make sure that they all are synchronized. Each chip is going to have a wire on there labeled as R with a line over it. That is the reset line, and this will be like a number of chips. All of your chips that uh, use the timing of the uh, circuit to operate will have this reset tied together. And what we want to do is when we turn on the computer, we want the computer to go through a hard reset. We just don't want things to happen at random. You turn on the power, it's just going to go to some random state and just not do anything. We've got to get the computer to do a hard reset to get it started up. You can't just send power to the chip. So here's the power line, which does go directly to the chip that says plus five volts, although it'll be probably of lower voltage these days. And what we want to do is get a hard reset signal to this when we turn on the power. Well, the line over the R means that the signal that tells it to do a hard reset is zero volts rather than the five volts. So we want to make sure that when the power comes on and everything stabilizes, all the powers of all the capacitors in there have charged up. Remember, it's going to take a little while for everything to happen because we have capacitors in there. They're going to take a short time to charge up and for everything to stabilize. So we want that chip to do a hard reset after everything is stabilized. So what we're going to do is put a capacitor across that line going to ground. And we're going to run the power to that, except we're going to do that through a resistor. So now what's going to happen is when we turn on the power, so this goes to our power supply I'll show as a battery, when we flip that power switch, the power is going to go to all the circuits, all the capacitors are going to charge up and stabilize, but this is going to be what? Remember, when you first start to charge a capacitor, the capacitor is zero volts. So I turn it on, that capacitor is at zero volts. And as long as it stays below a certain threshold, let's say in this case it's one volt, so this chip recognizes anything less than one volt as zero, as a logical zero. So that's the threshold of one volt. So we want this to remain a logical zero or something less than one volt long enough for everything to stabilize before it comes out of that and allows the chip to start its hard reset cycle. Because as soon as this reaches a logical one, it will do the reset cycle. So it start, has to go to zero, but then when it comes out of zero, it does the reset. So we turn on the power, everything stabilizes. This is still held at zero volts or a logical zero. It starts to climb up. And we've already said that when it reaches one volt, that's going to be recognized as a logical one and it will start the reset process. All we have to do is make sure that our resistance and our capacitance is such a combination that it takes maybe a second, long enough for everything to stabilize before this voltage climbs up above one volt. So there's a practical use for RC time constants that I know is used every day to restart a computer. So there's a practical use for RC time constants that's used in a circuit we use every day. Every time you turn on the power to your computer, that capacitor holds this reset line at a logical zero until everything stabilizes then allows it to climb up and once it comes out of zero it does the reset cycle. So a quick recap of what we've learned here. Get some of the clutter out of the way. Leave those up there and I'm just going to put a 
some basic symbols here, our voltage, our resistance, and our capacitance. So if we put a little bit of electricity into a capacitor, we get a little voltage. We put more in, we get more voltage. We put more in, we get more voltage. And we can continue doing this until one of two things happens. Either the voltage in the capacitor has reached the voltage of our source and we can no longer charge it, or it exceeds the capacity of the insulation and the insulation breaks down and the capacitor might explode. And that's uh, how a capacitor charges. And to predict what voltage it will be at a particular time, if you take your resistance times your capacitance, it tells you the time in seconds it will take to reach the magic number of 63.2% of the source voltage. And to find out how much it does after that, after each time constant, we go another 63.2% of the remaining voltage, whether we're charging or discharging. Charge, we go up 63.2% each time. Discharging, we go down 63.2% every time. If you found this video useful and informative, please give me a thumbs up down below. It really helps the channel. And subscribe because that not only informs you when I put new videos up, but it really helps the channel also. And a big thank you to my patrons at Patreon. I could not make these videos without your support. If you want to help me put these videos online and keep real vocational education free at vocademy.net, you can go to Patreon slash join slash vocademy and pledge your support. And again, a big thank you to my patrons who make this possible, and a big thank you to everyone for watching.